Okay, um, she is a professor in Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Oregon State University, and we tried to get our center called Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Those of you who are on the committee, you know, but we stuck with women. <laughs> this worked fine. <laughs> That there was controversy over gender, but we slipped it in. So, <laughs> you know. Susan is an ordained Baptist minister, and her background is in religious education and feminist studies. She teaches classes at Oregon State University in feminism and the Bible, and also global feminist theologies, feminist theologies in the United States, and feminist teaching and learning. So a wonderful array of, of topics. She is the author of numerous books covering feminist topics. Her most recent is a workbook with a is a book with a workbook titled Reflect, Reflective Faith, a toolbox. I'm sorry, Reflective Faith, a theological toolbox for women. Boy, that's hard to get. To. <laughs> a theological to toolbox for women. And she's gifted the center with both the book and the workbook. And so they're there, yeah. So they're there to check out. It's there to check out. And I have my own copy <laughs> that I'm really anxious to get through. So but anyway, please know if any of you'd like to check that out. It is uh, the purpose of this book is to make feminist theology and feminist biblical criticism accessible for a general audience. And um, so please think about the book and please come up to the center and look at it. So Susan, thank you so much for your generosity and your loyalty mm. to the USU. And thank you for coming so faithfully every year. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for your wonderful mm. self. You are the only person in the world who can give your talk today without inciting riots. <laughs> that remains to be seen. <laughs> talk is sweet little lie. The fragile religious right. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be back. I, th I think this is the fifth time I I've so. been here, maybe. Uh, so I feel like maybe part of my tenure line ought to be at USU <laughs> in addition to Oregon State. So, <laughs> so it's really good to, to be here. And uh, I always appreciate coming because I have opportunities to sort of try out my material and see how folks respond to it. And so I'll keep the talk pretty short. It'll probably be about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for dialogue, which was always my favorite part of this. And so we'll just jump right in and see where we go with things. So I suppose you heard that Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of a pizza joint. <laughs> and Trump had the largest inauguration crowd ever. Obama wiretapped Trump and his campaign. And climate change, you know, is not caused by humans. Now, these are just a few of the lies that many people on the Christian right have been willing to embrace in recent months. Uh, the election just passed was filled with fake news, which was widely shared on Facebook. And now our current administration has created a whole language of alternative facts to misinform and mislead. And yet, many Christians who profess belief in the God of truth willingly accept and often share blatant fabrications, exaggerations, and deceptions. And all that has led me to wonder why. But before I offer a few answers to that, let me give some caveats. So first of all, yes, I know the left has fake news too. So I don't read anything, for example, by Occupy Democrats or on Blue Nation Review, or, and there, there's another list, a, a whole list of those. But by far, the preponderance of fake news has been uh, created by and consumed by the right. Second caveat is when I talk about the Christian right, I do not mean all Christian conservatives. Conservative Christians are themselves a very diverse lot of people, and they can't be lumped together in one amorphous mass uh, any more than can people on the left. But I am talking about a fairly large swath of American conservative American Christendom that has aligned itself with the political right to such an extent that the two can no longer be separated. And I acknowledge that this group has a great deal of influence on an even larger circle of conservative Christians who may not fully embrace their tactics, but who are often swayed by their messages. So with those two caveats, let's go back to my question. Why have so many people on the Christian right been willing to accept falsehoods and fabrications? Now I imagine the full answer to this would be incredibly complex. 
I think often it feels like politics have become a team sport and people support their team no matter what. Uh, some other people explain that while they may find Trump personally troubling, they support the policies that he's enacting and so they put up with his tweets and lies. A lot of research suggests that we like to hear news that reinforces what we already believe. And so sometimes we'll just simply turn off our critical thinking filters in order to embrace what makes us feel good and more importantly, right. I want to add fr from my own thinking one other possibility to this mix and I've termed this Christian fragility. So let me explain a little bit about what I mean by that term. The idea first occurred to me in the wake of the 2015 Supreme Court decision that validated marriage equality. At that time, probably anybody who had a social media account undoubtedly saw the outcry for many members of the Christian right over that decision. And so while many Americans celebrated what was perceived as a triumph of love and social progress, many um, uh, Christian conservatives decried that same information as, as evidence of the country's moral decline and a precursor to the persecution of Christian pastors who preach against homosexuality or who refuse to perform a same-sex wedding. But the force of this outcry wasn't simply about people's religious convictions. It was also about what I'm calling Christian fragility. In 2011, Robin DiAngelo published a pivotal article on what she called white fragility. And according to DiAngelo, white fragility is an emotional and psychological state for white people in which racial stress is intolerable. This racial stress arises when white folks are confronted by their own racial privilege or find themselves in situations that are not racially familiar. This then leads them to a number of defensive maneuvers, such as outward displays of emotion, argumentation, or silence and withdrawal, in order to help themselves restore a sense of racial equilibrium. And so I see a lot of parallels between D'Angelo's notion of white fragility and these responses of certain conservative Christians to the marriage equality decision, as well as to a number of other social, political, and educational issues of the so-called culture wars. And as I'll suggest in a few minutes, I think that this is part of what has fueled the religious rights embrace of fake news and outright lies. Going back to D'Angelo, she also says that white dominance allows most whites to live in social environments that insulate them from challenging encounters with ideas or people who differ from themselves. And so within this dominant social environment, whites come to expect social comfort and a sense of belonging and even superiority. But when this comfort is disrupted, whites are often at a loss because they have not had to build the skills needed to engage with difference. And so they may become defensive and they'll actually go so far as to position themselves as victims of anti-racist work and they'll co-opt the rhetoric of violence to describe their experiences of being challenged on their racial privilege. I think this is very similar to the, the ways that many conservative Christians segregate much of their lives into enclaves with people who share their values. And then within these sharp subcultural boundaries of conservative Christianity, they insulate themselves from ideas and people who may issue direct and sustained challenges to their beliefs. Um, they also often learn from their leaders that they know the one right truth, capital T, with certainty. And therefore, opposing beliefs are dangerous, and they have to hold fast against the onslaught of these dangerous ideas. And in the U.S., since the 1980s, many conservative Christians have enjoyed a political prominence and widespread social acceptance of some of their ideals. So as late as the early 2000s, most Americans still opposed marriage equality. And so within that framework, conservative Christians were able to see their beliefs then as normative, natural, and inherent, reinforced by this broader social support across the country. And so within this sphere of social comfort, they really weren't ready for the speed with which national norms around marriage equality changed and disrupted these assumptions of Christian entitlement and Christian heteronormativity. So at that point, they were unprepared to engage in constructive dialogue about marriage equality and so often retreated into these defensive maneuvers of fragility, anger, fear, argumentation, and resistance as a way to try to reestablish that psychological equilibrium. So, for example, uh, then presidential candidate Mike Huckabee called for, a called for conservative Christians to, quote, resist and reject judicial tyranny, not retreat. Uh, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin called for a constitutional amendment to allow states to define marriage. Uh, 
And then Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal warned that the court's decision, and I quote, will pave the way for an all-out assault against the religious freedom rights of Christians who disagree with this decision. In pulpits around the country, conservative pastors railed against the decisions and pitted God against the Supreme Court. Now, some of you may not be familiar with inside, the inside of conservative Christianity. You wonder why such extreme and apocalyptic language about marriage equality. But I grew up a Southern Baptist fundamentalist, so I get this stuff. I understand the fear and discomfort that comes along with Christian fragility. Because these rigid belief systems do not prepare you to encounter difference. When you believe that there's one right way, one truth, capital T, then the options for dialogues with people who differ from you are pretty limited. And so the fear of turning away from the truth becomes very, very real. What gets ignored then in this Christian fragility is the social privilege that is, so social privilege that is actually accorded to Christians of all stripes in this country. For example, our holidays are embedded in the work calendar. Uh, we can easily find foods that our religion allows us to eat. Uh, we can even be elected president of the United States. <laughs> the men, anyway. Um, <laughs> by positioning conservative Christians as victims of religious oppression, many conservatives can then ignore the privileges that come with the intersection of their Christian faith with heterosexuality. And they can ignore the very real consequences of heterosexism on the lives of LGBTQ people. Real violence real economic disadvantage, real hate crimes that are complicated and intensified as we include intersections with race, gender, gender ideal, identity, ability, age, and social class. And so the dominance of heterosexuality over other forms of sexual identity becomes obscured in arguments about the anticipated victimization of conservative Christians for their beliefs about homosexuality. So essentially, they're moving themselves into the victim position as people disagree with them and ignoring the actual victimization of the people who are targeted for heterosexism. Similarly, recent legislation in states and the proposed, and watch for this one, the Federal First Amendment Defense Act, suggests that the expectation of non-discrimination against LGBTQ people is actually an infringement on religious liberty. So what that means is that the expectation that LGBTQ people can walk into a restaurant and have a meal or stay in a hotel without being denied accommodation becomes an infringement on religious liberty. So again, it's repositioning who is the victim within the, the oppression. And so these bills favor particular religious beliefs about sexuality, marriage, and gender, um, providing protections for the people who would deny services to LGBTQ people, and you know, going so far as to define who can use what bathroom. Um, but this legislation and the widespread support for it among many conservative Christians reflects forms of Christian privilege and Christian fragility that I would argue are actually in direct opposition to religious liberty. So despite arguments that somehow Christians in the United States are facing persecution, Christians actually hold incredible social, political, and economic power. And Christian beliefs often determine legislation, policies, practices, and budgets in social institutions ranging from education to health care to marriage to public bathrooms. Of course, one of the characteristics of privilege is that those who have it do not have to see it. The privilege is so assumed, so integrated into their identities and into the dominant culture that they don't have to notice the subtle advantages that they're given by their privilege. And so Christians in the U.S. do not have to see their Christian privilege. So they can see legislation that discriminates against other people simply as a reflection of sort of these amorphous American values and not notice the way that particular Christian beliefs, rather than some kind of universal value, have actually informed the laws that we enact. But when the laws change and the rights of marginalized people are recognized, the challenge to those assumptions of Christian privilege can feel like an attack on Christianity. Because certain Christians have assumed their religious worldview as normative, the laws that affirm, for example, marriage equality, may seem an attack on their presumed expectation of Christian norms. So they expect the world to conform to their Christian norms, and when it doesn't, it feels like it's an attack on their, their very faith. So in other words, Christian privilege allowed many Christians to understand heterosexual marriage as normative, natural, and inevitable. And therefore, same-sex marriage was an impossibility because it would have been unnatural, invisible, and outside the conceivable norm. 
Christian privilege didn't let some Christians even imagine that same-sex marriage could exist because marriage was synonymous with heterosexuality. And we didn't even need to say that because no other possibility existed. But then the affirmation of marriage equality by the Supreme Court disrupted Christian privilege by making the assumptions of heteronormative marriage visible and most importantly, changeable. But because some Christians had assumed marriage could only exist in consonance with their particular Christian understandings of marriage, the court's decision felt like an encroachment on their rights because privilege had allowed them to assume marriage as a right, even a God-given right, that belonged only to heterosexuals. Very similarly, the recent greater visibility of transgender people has challenged assumptions about the fixed nature of gender and certain Christian understandings of gender as something that is assigned by God and is therefore immutable. But because so much of Christianity is rooted in patriarchy, challenges to gender are particularly threatening because of their potential to undermine the, the hierarchies of gender that are, are at the very center of so much Christian theology. The very fact of transgender people makes visible the fiction of the immutability and inevitability of gender. So their very existence then becomes a threat to the notion that gender is something that can't change, that it's something that's given by God. So in response to the progress of LGBTQ people in the United States and this concurrent disruption of Christian privilege that has come with their progress, the fragility of a certain kind of Christian identity has led to reactions of anger and defensiveness, including passing legislation that in the guise of religious liberty actually institutionalizes discrimination against LGBTQ people for purely religious reasons. Most perplexing to me, however, is the extent to which Christian fragility leads some Christians to violate larger principles of Christian faith in order to regain the equilibrium of Christian privilege. So Christian notions of hospitality to strangers, love for enemies, sacrifice of one's own freedom for the sake of others are abandoned in the need to reinforce identities that are shaped by narrowly defined beliefs that are rooted much more in history and prejudice than in Christian love, the Bible, or Christian theology. All of that then leads me to lies, <laughs> because I think that Christian fragility is, has also led some Christians to accept fake news and lies because they prop up a particular kind of Christian identity. And so even when these Christians don't necessarily even believe the fake news or the lies, they accept their propagation because the end result of all these lies and deceptions is an affirmation of their identity. These lies reassert white heterosexual Christian privilege and domination and relieve the stress of the challenges that are presented to deeply felt but largely unexamined beliefs and prejudices. These lies allow certain Christians to position themselves as victims of discrimination and insulate themselves from people and ideas that might offer challenges to these beliefs. So in January, the New York Times told the story of a man named Cameron Harris, who created a website called ChristianTimesNewspaper.com. Harris developed the website essentially to make money from the advertising, which for each hour of work he put into the website, he made about a thousand bucks. So it's very lucrative business. And his, his, his business was making up fake news. So he sat down at his computer and he made up a story. The headline read, breaking tens of thousands of fraudulent Clinton votes found in Ohio warehouse. Did you all see that story? Yeah, yeah some of you did, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, the story was about how Clinton was positioning herself to steal the election. Um, he also wrote a story called NYPD looking to press charges against Bill Clinton for underage sex ring. So I guess they each had their separate sex rings going there. And Hillary Clinton files for divorce in New York courts. Eight of his stories were big enough, they were shared enough on social media that they had to be debunked by Snopes.com, which is a fact-checking website. And, and I would recommend to you, if you see something on the internet and you want to fact check it, go to Snopes.com and check it out and see if it's really true or not. Some other stories that have made the rounds among uh, conservative Christians on the internet. Um, a pastor was arrested for refusing to perform a same-sex wedding. Uh, someone is suing Bible publishers because the verses on homosexuality are offensive. Uh, the Pentagon is going to court-martial people for sharing their faith. And my personal favorite, Costco was selling the Bible in the fiction section. <laughs> All of these were passed round and round by outraged Christian people who didn't bother to check for accuracy and who didn't seem too bothered by the falsehood, especially when those falsehood 
fed the myth of the besieged Christian minority. Just this Thursday, uh, the New York Times ran an article about research that was done that was exploring partisanship as tribal identity. This is the phrase the researcher used. Um, her name is Liliana Mason. And she explained that as our identities, so gender, race, religion, geography, profession, ideologies, line up with partisan politics, we become more and more polarized with one political party then coming to represent the, to the totality of our identities. And she says then when these identities are attacked, people become defensive. And so they desire a win rather than a compromise, even when that compromise might be more beneficial to them. Uh, take the Affordable Care Act, for example, um, which actually benefits many of the people who voted for the administration that wants to get rid of it. But it was, it's a win because their side won, their political party that represents their identities. And so when people become willing to defend their party against any perceived threat, th they do so regardless of policy consequences. Because for them, abandoning their party or its president then would mean betraying their tribe and their identities that underlie it. And so with tribal loyalty comes acceptance of the falsehoods and fabrications from tribal leaders. Fortunately, some conservative Christians have begun to challenge others to check out the facts before circulating these stories. They've encouraged them to retract fake news that's been posted on social media and not to repost something that can't be confirmed. And I think those are good guidelines for all of us. Um, because I think the Bible's pretty clear that it's the truth that will set us free, not fake news. Um, but in a diverse and pluralistic world, retreating into falsehood to, to avoid confronting challenging ideas may feel more comfortable than actually engaging in conversations that might change our minds or even our hearts. And if our identity is dependent on a single known truth, then that identity becomes very fragile when that truth is challenged. And it's much easier to believe the lie than to risk having to reassess what one believes and the identity that one has constructed on those beliefs. And yet, while this discomfort of disequilibrium seems intolerable for many conservative Christians, there is a new wave of conservative Christians who has embraced the struggle to understand dis difference. And some of those have com come to support marriage equality, they work to end poverty, uh, they champion environmental justice. Uh, many of these folks have worked to provide alternative readings of the Bible that, while still holding the Bible in highest regard, also afford new understandings of some of the issues that have been so divisive among Christians. And so Christian fragility provides a framework for understanding these intense reactions of some conservative Christians to progressive social issues. And it helps explain some of their willingness to accept falsehoods. But I believe that Christian faith is only really fragile when it's unwilling to engage difference with open hearts and open minds. And I think that leaves great hope for us who are willing to engage the conversation. So with that, I'll sort of stop there and see what's, what it's provoking for you, what sort of thoughts and questions you might have. Let's see what you think. I know that was a lot of words in a short time, so I apologize for that. Okay, I'm going to try to, to, to frame my question um, in, a, in a way that it makes sense. So um, part of Christianity and the position it takes uh, towards gender and particularly patriarchy is also reflected in the way we, we represent God. Mm -hmm. We give God a gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you comment on that? I mean, I, I find that a very compelling argument yeah. for supporting the patriarchy. Oh, it is, absolutely. If we gender God male, we have supported the patriarchy, absolutely. Right. What I would argue is because God is all, and in all that God encompasses all genders. Right. I mean, I think God's transgender, right? Because God is all genders. <laughs> And it, what that does, it lets all of us then identify with God and it prevents hierarchies of gender because all of our genders exist in, in the person of God. Yeah. That one probably won't win me a lot of points with conservative <laughs> theologians, but. <laughs> what else, other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to comment on what Helga was saying. I mean, I, I study Hinduism as my area of, of strength and, um, Basically, in Hinduism, you have a situation where there are uh, traditions of worship to male deities, but equally strong and well-developed mm -hmm. traditions mm -hmm. of worship to female deities as mm -hmm. supreme divinities. <coughs> and then just as well-developed traditions of worship of a non-gendered divinity. 
uh, Brahman. Now, uh, what I've found and what research in, in India has found is that there's no direct correlation between how you see God in what gender you see God and and how you end up treating the people around you, and particularly in terms of how women uh, in India and Hindu women uh, get treated. So in other words, uh, it, it, it's sometimes the case that people in traditions that worship a male deity end up uh, valuing the voices of women more than people who worship female divinities, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so the point I want to make is that often it's more about who's doing the interpreting of mm -hmm. the tradition, of the sacred texts, mm -hmm. and how they're deploying that interpretation more mm -hmm. than the, uh, mm -hmm. some absolute theological mm -hmm. measure that we might put in place, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I mean, one of the things that, basically, I, I don't think it's an easy step going from a certain theology leads to a certain mm -hmm. perspective, but rather, here's the theology, and here's the text, and here's the tradition, and what do we do with it, and how do we mm -hmm. interpret it, uh, that, that mm -hmm. seems to make a greater difference. So, mm -hmm. in other words, I'm not denying that having a female divinity or mm -hmm. non-gendered and all-gendered divinity helps. Mm -hmm. It could help, but it would only help in the hands of someone yes. who mm -hmm. uh, has a particular mm -hmm. goal to mm -hmm. achieve, right? Yeah. Who has an interpretive goal. Yeah. So the hermeneutics matters more than any yeah. kind of absolute. Yeah, and it's kind of a chicken and egg because it's like, did the male god emerge from an existing patriarchy to support it, or did the male god give birth? Because because the Christian god was preceded, you know, by the the, the goddess, and so so really uh, Yahweh was a consort of the goddess b before Yahweh became the god of the Jews and then the monotheistic god of, of Christendom. So. Yeah, so, the, so there's some interesting questions there about how do these um, uh, images of God get deployed and by whom and for what, what purpose. So yeah, thank you. That's a great cl clarification. How does one have a conversation with persons who take sacred texts literally and that interpretation is <laughs> yeah. a major statement yeah. to us to interpret yeah. a literal text? How does yeah. one engage in oh. Oh, it's so hard, yeah. Yeah, I have to do this with my mother on an ongoing basis. <laughs> so, yeah, you struck home. But I grew up in, a, in, a, in the part of Southern Baptist life that, that called themselves literalist. And so for me, when, when I taught at a Southern Baptist college, what I did, because most, that's who most of my students were, is I just gave them questions about the text and let them sort of discover these issues for, for themselves very often. Because we're... In our churches, we're often taught to read the text in a particular way, and that becomes our only lens, and we really think that's the only way to read the text. And we've never had that disrupted by somebody saying, but what about this? And so, and so I'll give an example of one of the things I did with students that helped create really interesting discussions and, and got me in a lot of trouble, but it was worth it. Um, so conservative biblical literalists think that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and that becomes an absolute article of faith for them. But if you look at the text, that, that, that is highly unlikely, <laughs> and, and most biblical scholars don't accept that. Um, so, so what I would do with my students is I would give them a whole bunch of passages and I would, from the first five books of the Bible, and I would say, look at um, the style of writing in this, and look at all these stories that are repeated and the changes, and why do you think that's there, and um, look at what different words do they use for God here, and it, how is God, is, is God far away, is God close up, is God anthropomorphized, and so we would do all that, and I'd say, well, what does this lead you to conclude about authorship, and they'd always go, well, obviously more than one person wrote this, and I'd go, yes, and we have a name for that, and it's called the documentary hypothesis, and they'd get so excited about it until they go home and tell their mother or their pastor who would not, <laughs> not be excited. Uh, so, so I think it's, it, th that for me it starts with finding those places to ask a question to help people think in a, in a different sort of way. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, I could, I, I could sit down and have this kind of conversation with that group. I'd have a very different starting point. Because uh, you know, one of the basics of teaching is you start with learners where they are. And so if people are at literalism, we kind of have to start there. Um, but, 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 but they don't interpret the Bible literally either. I mean, the same people who will say that 
homosexuality is an abomination because it says so in Leviticus, absolutely ignore the passages right next to that that, that say don't eat meat and milk together, don't wear clothes of, of two different kinds of fabric, and put people who commit adultery to death. <laughs> and I don't hear anybody out there creating social movements for those sorts of things. And so I think we have to find those places where we can disrupt the sense of I know the only one right way. Uh, but it's hard. Um, I'm trying right now to actually just to have some political conversations with con some conservative folks via email. And again, our, our sources of knowledge are very different. And so I've raised the question with them, how do we have this conversation when we can't even agree on our sources of knowledge? Uh, so, so I think that those hard conversations have gotten harder in the last year, but I think we need to engage them. And I think part of the problem right now is, is we're not talking to each other, we're just kind of yelling at each other. And so we have to find that way at, to have the conversation. But not easy. Yeah. Thank you. That's a helpful question. Not somebody else. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. And I think it was an accurate description and prepared to uh, the response of a good part of the religious right. Um, but I guess I wanted to speak a little bit to um, the way you framed the problem was the sort of anticipated victimization. Mm -hmm. Um, being privileged over real victimization mm -hmm. that was actually mm -hmm. happening. And I think there's a fair bit of that. Mm -hmm. But I suppose I want to try to make some justification mm -hmm. for that feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think the kind of people I'm talking about are not the same group of the religious flight that you were That's probably about. true, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think mm -hmm. one of the things that freaks some religious conservatives out so much about mm -hmm. um, Obergefell, I was mm -hmm. mother's name, um, is not their privilege, but their arguments mm -hmm. were made, right? So mm -hmm. Robbie George and these kinds mm -hmm. of people in the religious right, I mm -hmm. guess you'd say, Robert George is some sheriff, Princeton, mm -hmm. right, who were making essentially natural law arguments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, not everybody has to be persuaded by natural law arguments, mm -hmm. but plainly these days fewer and fewer people are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the majority uh, opinion of the case, those arguments themselves were dismissed as not being arguments, mm -hmm. right? So the majority opinion mm -hmm. said, it's only from irrational animus mm -hmm. that someone could want to restrict marriage in a sort of heteronormative mm -hmm. way. What that says is, your arguments aren't really arguments. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that means, I think, if that's the view, mm -hmm. then I think that religious conservatives have some reason to freak mm -hmm. out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, we aren't even allowed to make our arguments in the public square. Mm -hmm. They won't be considered arguments. Mm -hmm. It's one thing for two, this is why Scalia, in his dissenting opinion, mm -hmm. said, you robbed the winners of, a, of an honest victory and you robbed mm -hmm. the losers of an honest loss, mm -hmm. right? An honest victory and an honest loss would have been, those are real arguments, in mm -hmm. the end they're not persuasive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But instead it was, those yeah. aren't even arguments. Mm -hmm. If that is true, yeah. if that's what the sort of, institution of the Supreme Court and other sort of mm -hmm. powers and sort of cultural institutional power mm -hmm. say, then boy, don't don't the religious mm -hmm. right have some reason to mm -hmm. feel like, boy, we've got some legitimate anticipated victimhood mm -hmm. ahead of us here. Mm -hmm. Our arguments aren't even allowed in the public square. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. I mean, that, that I think the feelings are are legitimate. I would never you know, argue that they're illegitimate. And I, I yeah, and I think <laughs> While the Supreme Court, you know, of course, of dealing with legal issues, when they deal with religious stuff, they're, it's always troubling, you know, because I don't think, again, since they're not religious scholars, they're legal scholars, they don't always capture those sorts of, of nuances with that. Um, but I think it, even though, though, though I think it, it, one's feelings are legitimate, that, again, I think that those get employed in such a way to become a justification for things that either are not going to happen or are not true forms of religious discrimination. For, for example, the bakery case in Oregon. So there was a bakery where there was a lesbian couple and they used to go in and get their cookies and stuff there all the time and so they wanted these folks to bake their wedding cake. And Oregon has non-discrimination laws. You cannot discriminate um, in employment, in accommodation, and anything that's public has to be offered to everybody. And so um, they went in, they asked for the wedding cake and they got told no and the way the, the story goes is they, it wasn't just we won't bake it, it was kind of going on into some of the ugliness that goes along with that. And so under Oregon law, they sued and they won, 
And it, it really blew up because this became a case of now these people who have to bake a wedding cake are, are well, they actually closed the bakery down. But this, my, this was religious discrimination against them. And so that's more the kind of argument that I worry about because, um, again, it was a, a public business that had opened its doors to everyone. Because I would want to ask them, do you bake cakes for divorced people who are getting remarried? Because the Bible's quite clear about that. Do you bake cakes for a Christian who's marrying a non-Christian? Because, again, the Bible's quite clear about that. Because if not, then it is absolutely di discrimination. Uh, you know, and so and I think that, that that's what often is being argued is we don't want to have to do these sorts of things, even though in these other contradictory <coughs> ways they bake cakes for all kinds of other people who are sort of in violation of God's law in, in their sins. Um, so I, wouldn't, I would not discount their feelings or the legitimacy of how they hear the arguments, but I think where they go with it is, is where it's so problematic. So it becomes this, you know, like the argument that somehow suddenly we're going to um, prosecute pastors who won't perform gay weddings. And that's very clearly a violation of the First Amendment. That's not going to happen. And I got news from, you know, gay people do not want people to marry them if they don't want to do it. I mean, it's just, you know, the last thing you want to do is like so politicize your wedding. Like, okay, which pastor can, who hates gay folk can I go and ask to do my, you know, I mean, that, that's not going to happen. But, but I think those are the kinds of nuances that it's important to pay attention to about kind of what's really going on and what's really, and yeah, every once in a while I do wish the, the court would nuance its arguments a little better. Yeah, because I think they could have made us an even stronger argument. Uh, thank you. Uh, somebody else. So your um, discussion of a transgender God, which mm -hmm. I think is just delicious, mm -hmm. um, you, I'm sure you realize that the LDS faith, and, I, and I'm not assuming that everybody here is LDS, mm -hmm. so if, you know, but the LDS faith is very clear about gender, that there's a gender for, from time immemorial. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> let's see, how, how do your ideas play out with faith, like faiths, faith traditions that have such a, mm -hmm. such a strong sense of gender? Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about um, um, maybe, quote, gender mistakes at birth. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. that, but just a very strong mm -hmm. sense that this is your gender. I mm -hmm. mean, how does that work into what you're talking about? And I don't even know if that yeah. question makes sense. No, it does. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, people have their belief systems, and, uh, you know, the, the Baptist to me, because we are really into, like, religious liberty and separation of church and state, would absolutely fight for your idea, your, your right to believe that, but then I'd fight with it for, for my right to, to argue with you about it and to raise those sorts of questions of, well, you know, has gender always been the same across all times and cultures? If gender is inevitable, if it is immutable, you know? I mean, even today, gender gets expressed differently than it did when Joseph Smith would have been, you know, gendered. And so we could have those kinds of conversations. Um, but, but I think people have the right to, to have the tenets of their religious faith. I think that's what the First Amendment, one of the things that it protects. But it doesn't mean I can't dispute you. And it, it, it certainly for me does not mean that you get the right to impose religious beliefs in the public square through law. Because I think that's the other thing that the First Amendment protects. It's you know, freedom for and from <laughs> religion. Uh, May I ask another please? question? Please. Yeah. Okay, I've had this question ever since I was a teenager growing up on a ranch over in so, <clears throat> very little to do there, so we read our Bible all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I came to that part in, I don't know, you know, about Lot's daughters, mm -hmm. and the angels coming to visit Lot, mm -hmm. and the men, according to the Bible, wanted to sexually know the angels, and mm -hmm. so Lot was so upset. That, I, mm -hmm. I know you know this, I'm just mm -hmm. kind of giving the background. Mm -hmm. So, Lot's then, Lot then gave his daughters up to mm -hmm. gang rape so that the angels wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So, I brought that up in Sunday school, and... You were a troublemaker even back then, weren't you? <laughs> that created a lot of problems. And, and, I was, and I was just asking an innocent question yeah. that I still have not had yeah. answered. How is that justified? What justification yeah. have you heard uh, from the religious right that it is okay for gang rape of a woman, but yeah. not of a man? Okay, so the response I get is that... While Lot was probably wrong to offer that um, because the angels then took care of the situation, it didn't happen, and that becomes 
the response to Lot, that Lot shouldn't have done it anyway. He should have trusted and let God deal with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't hear them justifying some man offering up his daughters instead. Yeah. But, yeah, but it makes sense. I mean, you know, within Lot's cultural, norms. so hospitality was key for the Israelites, and so for her, his guests to be attacked in this way would have violated every hospitality norm known. Girls were property, and they were generally property that was going to be a problem anyway. So, so you can see where Lot, in his sort of misogynistic mind, could do that. But, but what I've heard conservative interpreters say is that the text takes care of it by not allowing this to happen at all to anybody, so that the angels basically represent God's judgment on the people who were trying to do this. Yeah. Thank you. That solves probably 60 yeah. years of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> so do you see any cohort differences with this Christian mm -hmm. fragility? Yeah. Or can you explain yeah. cohort? A bit yeah, absolutely. I think that um, among young evangelicals that we are seeing those changes. Um, the research shows that young evangelicals are much more accepting of LGBT folks. They're, um, like I said, much more likely to be environmentally uh, conscious and aware. Uh, they, um, I think, are much more likely to engage uh, because they don't remember the culture wars, and so they kind of see that as ancient history. And so they're much more willing, I think, to engage. They've been brought up, um, you know, with the, the advances of the women's movement, the LGBT movement, the civil rights movement, with new awareness of, of uh, global, the global world. Uh, and so I think they're renegotiating ways to be evangelical Christian and have the social justice framework, which makes, I mean, part of the reason I came to all of this was out of my little fundamentalist upbringing because I took it quite seriously when the Bible said, love everybody, love your enemies, do good to the, you know. So I'm always a little surprised at the bad behavior when people mistreat one another in the name of, of religious faith, because that's so not the message that resonated with me. So I'm actually very hopeful that as the folks who are now in their teens and 20s are moving up, that we'll see some shifts um, toward uh, uh, more openness for dialogue and more willing to embrace difference. Uh, but I think my generation, which was right in the midst of the culture wars and the generation that is a little bit older than I am, are still engaged in, in those wars. And I think a lot of that came to the fore during this election where you saw all these different forces colliding. Um, and I think it, it does point to a way that the left has uh, given the ground of talking about social class in meaningful ways. It's um, shown how we have failed in helping people see that being allies to one another actually benefits all of us and that all of us across our differences of social class, gender, race, religion, fare better if we're working together because the problems are really a very small group of people who have the real money, the real wealth, the real political influence, and that's not most of us. But the, these ideologies manage to divide us even more. And now because of these trends we're seeing toward partisanship and that sense of, you know, I am my political party, that the gulf, so, and that worries me about how do we talk across this gulf. Um, because even the people I'm trying to talk to, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult because we believe and see and hear different things and we experience them so differently. And so I'm hopeful for the future, the, the distant future, not the next <laughs> few years. I'm worried about those. So, yeah. this religious right, and they are completely, yeah. have no idea they're being manipulated, yeah. they have complete um, ignorance yeah. that they are just following through what economic yeah. devices are out there. What is your thought? 
Well, I certainly think if we go all the way back to Reagan and we look at the things that are so important to the religious right, none of that's happened legislatively. You know, Roe v. Wade is not overturned. Um, in fact, we've made strides in terms of uh, LGBT Q rights. I mean, so some of those things that matter. And, and so in that sense, I think we have evidence that the, the social concerns were not what mattered. What's interesting, though, is we're seeing some drift from that now that's really sort of interesting. And so while Bill Clinton's morality mattered, Donald Trump's no longer matters. And, and the Christian right is very um, consciously saying, we don't care. As long as he's enacting these policies, as long as he will name Supreme Court justices that tick these boxes, we don't care how badly he behaves personally. And that's a sea change from what we saw in the 80s and 90s. And you've had a few people, um, Russell Moore, who runs the uh, Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. I doubt he and I would agree on anything except this thing, that it is hypocritical that Christians ignore the behavior of a man to support for president, you know, simply because uh, he's going to enact some policies that they like. And, and actually, I don't know if he's, that he's lost his job yet, but I know a couple weeks ago he was this close to losing his job over this. And again, this is, I mean, theologically he is as far right as you can imagine. I mean, he is everything you think Southern Baptists are, but he wants them to behave well and to be consistent. Now he's in trouble for it. And I find that just shocking that, I, I do and I don't, because they do go after their own as soon as there is any sort of disagreement from whatever the party line is at the moment. But uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, I think that's discouraging to, to see that, this sort of willing embrace. So it's not just the lies, but it's also the bad behavior. They don't care that he thinks it's okay to grab women by their private parts, and they don't care that he says, I've never asked for forgiveness. How can an evangelical accept someone as an evangelical who says he's never asked for forgiveness since that's at the core of evangelical theology? I mean, it's sort of baffling. But the answer is always, but Supreme Court justices. And what Russell Moore tries to say is, is that really all that matters? Does the the means not matter if we get the end that we want. And he's trying to say the means matter, and he's in a lot of trouble for that. So never thought I'd see the day I'd be defending Russell Moore. <laughs> it's shocking to me, but we're on the same page with that. Uh, let's see, I think you had to hand up. Yeah, yeah I'm curious how you um, rhyme your hopeful outlook for the future with um, the fact that the young generation, yeah. which I agree with you, the young yeah. generation seems to be much more open and accepting toward LGBTQ mm -hmm. people. Uh, concerned mm -hmm. with the environment, social justice, mm -hmm. inequality, et cetera. Does that cohort really need a God or a religious tradition? Well, no. <laughs> um, because I think that people of religious faith and people who are non-religious can come to those things through different means and, and meet in the middle with the same ends in mind. And I think this group may be more open to it. Certainly there are going to be people who still think, oh no, it must be this one particular way. But I think that th they're a little more pluralistic, a little more successfully than, than we are. And I think that, the, that for a lot of them, their notions of God are expanded and more inclusive in some ways. And I'm, I'm anxious to see, I hope I live long enough to see where all that, that that can possibly go. I mean, I think there's some things we need to watch out for with, with that particular generation because there's also a tendency um, to want to shut down dialogue if, if you don't agree with it. And again, I think we have to remember that the answer to bad speech is more speech, not shutting down speech. And so I think we still have some things to teach folk about how to be successful in these, these endeavors toward transformation. Right. So what I was trying to get at, and thank you for yeah. helping me clarify this, was yes, I see um, in, in my hopeful days, I see a movement mm -hmm. toward greater justice in mm -hmm. our society. At the same time, I also see a great a movement toward less relevance mm -hmm. of church and religion oh, mm -hmm. in those yeah. endeavors. Yeah. And then again, what will yeah. ten years from now, yeah. what will the religious landscape look like? Have we, as people of faith, made our faith traditions utterly irrelevant? We're getting there. I mean, and, and that's on us, right? That is on us when we have made been so rigid and so dogmatic that, that we've sidelined ourselves. And I know people think that they do that because this is the truth and I know it. But I think a lot of other people kind of think, no, not really. Um, particularly when you think about the different 
life experiences and cultures and places that people bring to thinking about God. And so for me, I see those as all wonderful ways to, to expand our understandings of God more fully. Um, so I love reading like the, the feminist theologians out of Africa and Asia because they see the world so differently than I do. And they help m m my understandings get bigger. So I think there are places where we can be relevant, but the question is, will the church at large choose to do so? I mean, will it be on the side of people, which is liberation theologian, I would say, is God's side, or are they going to continue to care more about the structures and the functions of the institutional church rather than the church's mission in the world, which I think is about love and justice and the earth and all those sorts of issues. One issue, just to follow up on that though, and actually Ross, you had, had a nice article mm. about this in the New York Times yesterday about pleading for social progressives to return to mainline Protestantism. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because the churches that are doing what you just described, mainline Protestant churches, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, Episcopal Church, Methodist mm -hmm. Church, Presbyterian, they are seeing drastic reductions in numbers of people attending, yeah. which I think was Karen's point, right? Yeah. You know, the churches that are hitching their wagon to sort of social justice, yeah. social progress, are rapidly declining yep. in membership, and it's not unimaginable in 50 years, the yeah. Episcopal Church, for example, in the United States, is basically non-existent, yeah. right? Yeah. And the question is how, and I take it this is part of what you're getting at, is does moving in the direction yeah. of pluralism mean that yeah. institutional religiosity yeah. declines. And I think for yeah. the young it is. So mm -hmm. the, all of the ones who yeah. describe themselves as nuns, right, and spiritual but not religious. And yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. the faith traditions have done too little too late. Yeah. They've been so rigid for far too long. Yeah. And uh, I think the religious landscape in the USA in 50 years will yeah. be unrecognizable from what it is yeah. today. Yeah, and, and some of it is, uh, there's this sort of, uh, Part of the nature of liberalism, that it's not particularly proselytizing. I remember when we were going through the fundamentalists take over the Southern Baptist Convention, and every year, I mean, the fundamentalists would turn out in force to vote for the president of the convention, and the moderates may or may not show up. And I remember one of my professors saying, well, you know, if a fundamentalist said to his congregation, and always his in that case, go count cars on the freeway, God said so, they'd go count cars on the freeway. If a moderate said to moderates, go count cars on the freeway, we'd all go, are you nuts? No, I'm not going to count cars, and God did not say that. And, and so the, 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 the sort of identity structures of, of different groups actually, I think, contribute to the success of one. And so liberals just, we can't get it together. Partly because our beliefs are we don't need to get it together because everybody's got to have room to be and do. You know, so I don't know how you sustain social movements when, and then when we do finally get together, we fight like we, we did with the Women's March and the horrible fights, that, the infighting that went on among feminists of different stripes over important issues, but issues that almost tore the march apart. Unfortunately, they worked it out and the march was a success. But can we even sustain the momentum from, from that? And I don't know, that, that always makes me a little nervous. So the one thing that I've been thinking about <clears throat> lately that is kind of troubling, and maybe it shouldn't even be troubling, but is, which you could probably answer, is like this view on, on some religious rights. So um, you can be openly gay, but you can't act upon it. Yeah. Is there research saying that that is harmful? Like what would be the outcome of mm -hmm. living your life as openly gay, but not ever participating in any yeah, well, yeah, cer so certainly so there really there have been religious people throughout history who've chosen celibacy for a wide variety of reasons. So I don't think cel the choice of celibacy is a bad thing. It's why you do it. Yeah. And I think if it's simply because you're gay, yeah, that's a problem. Because again, that's saying there's something different that is lesser than. There's something wrong, fundamentally. What the, the Catholic Church calls it inherently disordered about you. And so, yeah, that has horrible impact on people. And again, it's something we ask of one group but not of another. You know, so, so, you know, there may be places where they ask um, celibacy of everybody who's not married, and that's fairly consistent. And it's like, okay. But then if it only allows the option of marriage to one particular group, I think that does create uh, troubling dynamics for folks. And so you see the, the, the outcomes. And we, we know that, you know, LGBT kids are bullied in, in schools. We know that they are more susceptible to committing suicide as teenagers because of all of these pressures. And so real harm comes from churches and other institutions telling you there's something wrong with you, you know. Even in the guise of, you know, 
love the sinner, hate the sin. I mean, that's just, oh, that's just what would be an appropriate word to use? <laughs> I want to be careful, not, not use offensive language. But it's just, it, that's not, it's just not true. It's just not helpful to say that. Um, because still, it, 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 it suggests that somehow there's something wrong with you. Um, so just a, a quick comment uh, and then a, a real question. Um, first of all, I, I really appreciated the comment you made in response to Karen's first question, uh, namely, the sources of knowledge are really crucial. I found mm -hmm. in dialogues with mm -hmm. people who disagree with me, often just setting that out first and saying, mm -hmm. what are our sources of knowledge? Uh, where do we get valid knowledge from? Mm -hmm. And then allowing each side to investigate their own mm -hmm. uh, uh, valid source yeah, of knowledge yeah. and then questioning that. And, and that, that, I mean, questioning, I mean, having a real, asking questions about their sources of knowledge yeah. and why they interpret them yeah. the way they do. Yeah. And I find that's not uh, an easy process. It's a very time-consuming one, mm -hmm. but it's the only way I have found to, to bridge that divide. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you just end up kind of talking yep. like this. And yep. it's, you're using the same terms and meaning completely different things. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so, anyway, uh, so thank you for that yeah. uh, yeah. comment. I just wanted to highlight that. Uh -huh. uh, the question I had, and, and maybe we don't have mm -hmm. time for this, but um, you've mentioned kind of uh, love as kind of a foundational mm -hmm. point many times here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just wanted to raise the question as to whether, um, uh, whether it's, it's as uh, agreeable uh, mm -hmm. as it seems from your comments mm -hmm. as to what love means. Yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. in, in conversations and dialogues yeah. with evangelical Christians I've had, uh, love can be in the Bible can be interpreted in ways that yeah. I didn't see coming. And so, yeah. you know, it, it may be, for example, that, uh, well, love for neighbor means not necessarily appreciation for the neighbor, mm -hmm. but sometimes tough love. And, yeah. and being very clear as to mm -hmm. what is good for them and what mm -hmm. not. And that sort of all-embracing mm -hmm. love that, that you seem to be mentioning yeah. is reserved for love of the brethren, yeah. right? So it's, it's really yeah. Jesus' point that you love the people who are like yeah. you and not so much for love for yeah. the neighbor. Could you say something about that? Or yeah. Something? Very quick, I can, because I don't think, you know, I, I think Jesus' love is the inclusive love. You know, because in the story of the Samaritan, you know, he didn't ask the guy what got you in the ditch and were you drunk and were you doing something you didn't, well, wh why were you here when you shouldn't, you know, it was just, I'm just going to take you, I'm going to pay for everything and it's done. And Jesus said, that's who your neighbor is. And, you know, you, you have to remember that these are people who would not have liked each other, who would have disagreed theologically with each other. And so for me, there, there are no, you know, cutoff points. For, for, for God's love, that nobody's outside of that. And for me, that's the biblical witness. And yeah, sometimes that may mean tough love, and that's why I speak out to conservative Christians all the time, because it is my tough love back to my people. And I, <laughs> and I thought, you, you gave birth, you taught me this stuff, you told me to take the Bible seriously, you told me God could speak directly to me, you in fact told me I could be anything God called me to be, and this is it. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. You know, so I think there's that place for that, but, it, but what that means is I do not get to cut them out of the circle for, of people for whom I have compassion and whom I have authentic love, even when I want to so bad. And <laughs> because I recognize that, that if for me, I don't think that the, the, the Bible allows that. I don't think my experience of faith allows that. And so I would actually contend with people who say that there are any parameters on God's love that that's absolutely not the biblical witness. Yeah. And, and again, I think that's something that, that you would find in so many world religions, right? There's this sort of central concept of compassion, care for others, love for others that we do share across religious traditions. And, and so that's part of what helps me keep doing this work and not throwing my hands up. There are days I feel like throwing my hands up with it. Uh, but I think that we are called to love. And that love can often involve these difficult dialogues. So I just keep at it, even though I'm getting old and tired, but I keep at it. So anyway, I think you, you were motioning me it's time to <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> year, Dr. Shaw has already agreed to come <laughs> and talk about the intersectionality of... Well, we're kind of, I'm working on a new book with um, uh, Grace G. Sun Kim, who's a Korean-American feminist theologian at Earlham School of Religion, and we're calling it Intersectional Theology. And what we're going to try to do is to take the work done by black feminists around intersectionality and ask what would it mean if we embedded that in theological method. So that now when we talk about God, we have to take into consideration the intersections of gender, race, social class, et cetera, et cetera. So oh. I'll come up with something for next yeah. year to talk about. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody.